And there we go. Hello. <laughs> hey, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining. Which means of course. course. Uh, we will talk about motorcycles and filmmaking. So, um, Matthias, um, you have a book that I, I have do. here and actually bought it before I knew you. And it's about a trip that you recently did um, from Brooklyn to Argentina within a half a year or so. How are you coming up with this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, coming up with this idea? It was three. It was three years ago. Um, so you, so you asked me, uh, how did that come up, come about? Yeah, the idea. Um, I mean, the idea was something that had been on my mind and, and Joel's mind. We've been talking for like literally 18 years at that time. And uh, we always wanted to do sort of a longer trip. We've done small things in Spain and uh, a couple of things here in the US, but we always want to do a big trip. But as you know, life gets sort of in the way and um, either money or time or a job or a company, you know, you know, you always sort of try to find that time. And, and we knew it was a big thing, so it was hard to find that time. But um, th the truth is that there was a moment in 2015 when I left my company um, that I started. And also, I, my sister passed away six, five months after that. So that sort of threw me off for, for, a, for a loop and, um, and put me sort of in a meditative state of like, what, where, do, where do I want to go? What is you know, what is the next sort of, uh, the next step. And mm -hmm. what I realized is that one of the things I didn't want to do is regret um, if the time came for me, you know, the, 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 the last moment of, of bread came for me, I didn't want to regret not having done this specifically. Oh. So it came rushing and I said, I got to do this. And literally over a period of two days, I saw it so clearly. And I think maybe a week after I called Joel and I asked him and he said, yes. And, uh, and the rest is sort of history. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's nice. But you not went with like regular BMW GS adventure bike. No, you, you needed to take like a, an old bike. You guys, <laughs> what is it? It's like a GS80 from the 70s or 80s. It's an R80, it's a 1985 R8 GS. And Joel's is an R80 ST from 83 converted to a, G, converted to a GS with a forks. I didn't need to do that is that Joel and I, one of the reasons why we're very good friends is that we both love vintage BMWs. It's yeah. just something about the feel, something about the sound, and also something, it's sort of, it's emotional, uh, you know, as well. And we don't feel much attachment to modern motorcycles. And that's, that's what it is. Some people like purple, some people like red, you know, so that's a very close colors, but you know, <laughs> green. Uh, but you know, it's like, we just feel connected to these things. And for us, it makes sense. Also, we, I believe that because I do know how to maintain and sort of repair these motorcycles, it made sense to me if we were going to be in isolated places to not go with a motorcycle that has 11 sensors that can break and that you mm -hmm. cannot repair. Um, so that was sort of my, the reason why we took vintage BMWs. Yeah. So you actually wasn't afraid. <laughs> yeah, cheers, man. <laughs> So you actually weren't afraid, like taking this old bike on a trip. You actually feel comfortable. Absolutely. Also, you mm -hmm. know, through my friend Peter, Peter Borja from Motor Borgataro, right next to Union Garage, uh, mm -hmm. in, in Red Hook, he had been teaching me how to prepare these motorcycles. So, mm -hmm. I think that the thing about vintage or older motorcycles is that if you don't fix the things that are might be broken, if you don't uh, sort of check everything you know mm -hmm. yeah things can break but mm -hmm. things break i've seen our 1200 gs adventures on the middle of the road in argentina and in bolivia like i've seen that like it's not that they don't break yeah. it's that if you don't know what you're doing it doesn't matter what bike you ride that's right. the thing so can i fix a r 1200 gs no yeah. neither i care for but no can i fix uh, uh r80 yes so that's what sort of the choice you know for yeah. me so you already mentioned that you guys prepared the bike. Um, what can I imagine there? How did you prepare a bike for this kind of journey? Well, you, I mean, I have in the book has a very, very long list, uh, basically making sure that all the seals, all the rubbers, all uh, the things that need to be adjusted from like the valve adjustment to obviously new plugs to make sure that the cables are in good condition um, and just torque every ball to spec on every part of the motorcycle to make sure that, you know, if you're going to be at 80 miles per hour, that nothing sort of blows up. Mm -hmm. um, and 
basically just check absolutely everything, you know, from mm -hmm. the rear, uh, you know, the, the, the final drive seals, uh, the swing arm, the transmission, the transmission seals, absolutely sort of everything that could be modified. We didn't go into the transmission itself or rebuild mm -hmm. the entire motor because it was not necessary because the bike was already running well. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's it's sort of like a long laundry list of things that it's in the book, you know. Yeah. yeah. Did you have uh, any kind of technical failures on on the trip? You you were going like for six months, going off road and fully loaded. Mostly, we got punctures, um, but mm -hmm. good thing is that we carry tubes, mm -hmm. and I know how to change the tube. So even once when we. Uh, had a puncture in the middle of like the a, a, a valley in, in Colombia like there was just a few people there in a mm -hmm. very very small village with nothing um, um, I was able to fix it there because we carried two spares for both um, the only thing that broke 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 was Joel's uh, ignition coil mm -hmm. it's an electrical component we were going through the Unisol flats and I think the coil was already asking to to for forgiveness you know Mm -hmm. But thank God we carried one, you know, we carried the spare with us. So once I figured that was the problem, I just switched it and we were, we were ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I would do different now is I would replace probably this 40 year old coils. Um, okay. mine, but mine was also 40 year old and didn't break. That was um, <laughs> I had to fix a couple of leaks um, in my bike, but leaks are leaks. It's just annoyance. Um, yeah. But those are two things I didn't do pre prior to leaving. My naivete was, or my, you know, my, I should have known that I should have changed that. But because they were working, I didn't. So a lot of yeah. things learned, you know, for the next, yeah. for the next adventure. I haven't been on such long journey, like for six months. What, what are you missing the most if you be away for so long and being on a motorcycle? That's a very good question. I think... It, it, it's hard for people to un, not understand, but to, to know what this feels unless you'd really go. Because there, there are different stages of the journey internally. I think internally mostly, like, of course, there, you know, there's North America, Central America, and South America. But to me, there is this first three weeks, first three days is one thing. The first three weeks, you still connected to this, mm -hmm, to, this mm -hmm. to this New York, to my friends, to being on the phone, to replying to texts, to sort of, and then as you move into areas also, as the days pass and you get used to being on the bike, to get used to not being connected to all those things that you know and there are your routines, then you start sort of leaning onto that. And I remember, for example, when we were in Bolivia, there were areas where we had no reception for four days. Okay. And after you're like, oh shit, we don't have any reception and you just say, that's cool there is a massive sense of peace because yeah. you're just there. That's it. <laughs> you're nowhere else. It's Joel and it's you. And it's a fucking landscape. And yeah. that's about it. And that's a beautiful sense of, of, of peace that is rare to achieve forced, but forced by nature physically, like by the fact that you are on your own. And that's a very beautiful thing. I miss that, but I also miss the something which is also exhausting but at the same time is beautiful is every day is a new place yeah yeah you know? and uh, it's just there's a beautiful sense of moving forward moving always forward in one direction you know i've done things where i've gone three or four days with my friend brian and i and john uh from you know new orleans where you go and then you have to come back mm -hmm. fuck i hate that kind of trip now you know it's <laughs> I get it. I get it. I've done it. I've done it so many times, but I fucking hate it because you're sort of backtracking or you're just going back. So even when you're moving forward, and this is the point, even when you're moving forward, you know you have to go back. And mm -hmm. this one, I didn't. And yeah. that is a beautiful feeling. And that's a hard feeling to explain. Yeah. So yeah. That's sort of something I miss a lot. And simple mm -hmm. things like knowing that my entire life is on that bike. That's it. That's yeah. a beautiful thing. Yeah. It's a very beautiful thing. What I think what is very challenging as well, and I'm very excited to hear the answer how you guys do that, you are 180 days together. You are two people. You're not traveling on your own, so you have to take uh, uh, care about your fellow on the trip. How you manage that, that you're not after a while like hate each other? <laughs> well, Joel and I are very good friends, very old good friends. Joel and I know each other since 
we were 15 years old. Uh, I'm 41 now, so do the math. Um, and Joel and I have traveled together, have vacationed together. Joel and I had been around each other for a very long time. Um, not so much in the times where I obviously live here in New York City and he lives in Barcelona, but you know, we spend a lot of time together. And um, Joel and I are very different human beings, extremely different, but very compatible. Okay. And I think the main key is that there was no surprises. Mm -hmm. The things he doesn't like about me or piss him off about me or annoy him about me, he knows. That's okay. the secret thing. Okay. It's not so much that I'm perfect, neither is he, mm -hmm. or that we have this perfect relationship. No, I get pissed at him, he gets pissed at me. But, <laughs> but it lasts four minutes. Yeah. And also, not pissed, it's like, uh, I know this, you know? Yeah. It's like uh, your brother, you know, like, what are you going to do? It's the yeah. way, it is, you know, so I think that's the secret. If yeah. I was going to, if anyone and people ask me like, oh, I'm trying to find someone to go on a trip. What I say is try to get to know this person because it doesn't matter how cool you think they are, how mm -hmm. compatible you think you are. Because what happens is that when you're going into this journey, the more you are going into harder situations, the more it becomes true you. You know, mm -hmm. who is Matthias at the edge? You know, mm -hmm. who is uh, JP at his, at, at his worst? Mm -hmm. At his best is awesome. At his best, you know it, probably. <laughs> you know my at my best, you know? Yeah. Do you know me at my worst? And worst doesn't mean like, I'm gonna murder you, but like, I'm tired, I'm disappointed with myself, I'm sad, I'm trying to fix something, I'm done. Da -da -da -da. Mm -hmm. What is it? Can I, can I, can I not put it out on you? Can I just be, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's so much. No surprises is really the, the crucial thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you guys have my total respect. If I talk to people that are like world travelers, they often find companions that go with them for part of the trip, but then they split up again. Because yeah. It doesn't work out. So. Well, I have a bunch of friends that do that. Leah, mm -hmm. Leah Wright got to go, Sinje got well, um, uh, Kinga and... Uh, Adventurism, Nora. There's a lot of women mm -hmm. actually also, uh, and uh, Timber took uh, Timber uh, Burke, um, also solo writers. And mm -hmm. I think the solo writing is is a character. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean they want to do everything alone, but mm -hmm. solo writing is a thing. Um, I don't know if I'm there. I don't know if that's me. That's the thing. I have my friend John loves writing by himself, but also I think loves writing with me. Um, I think you have to, it's, it, you know, but funny enough, I love working by myself. Yeah. Yeah. All so, right. <laughs> so I don't know. I think, I think um, we did that. We joined someone. And when you join a third person into this team, it completely changes the dynamic, which teaches you a lot about you and your friend. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, the other person is just being themselves, whatever. Yeah. It's super interesting. Uh, I'm more of a, I like to share my moments. Nice. Okay, that's uh, interesting. So you guys traveled 13 countries. I just read the numbers. 168 days. Yes. Uh, did anything dangerous happen on, uh, on the trip? Were you saying, oh, that was a, a <laughs> tough situation? Or we should not well, look at I mean, there was one moment. Uh, I don't think, I didn't feel danger uh, uh, overall. I think people think that, you know, I got, these things told to me like, oh, be careful in Mexico, you know, it's very dangerous. I didn't have any problems in Mexico. Uh, Central America, South America, there was just one instance in Guatemala where we were in this very sort of uh, isolated valley and there was, uh, you know, uh, this sort of shitty off-road and we took the secondary road to get to a place and, and we come onto a curve. And mind you, I haven't seen anyone for two hours, you know? And there's this guy with a rope and they do this sort of toll thing. Um, and he's fixing the road. The road is a piece of shit for like 20 miles and he's fixing like 10 meters. And I'm like, really? And I stop and I say, hey, literally, we literally had spent our money for that morning and breakfast and we were going somewhere. We had enough gas, we're going somewhere, we'll get more cash there. We didn't have any more money. Um, <laughs> and he said, it's five quetzales each. And five quetzales, mind you, it's probably $2, it's nothing. But it was very hot, I was very tired, and I was like, I, listen, I don't have any money. It's like, no, no, it's five quetzales each. And he's very adamant. 
and he's on my left. Joel, I don't know why, is like 50 meters behind me, like 100 yards. Um, and at some point, I, I, I'm so hot. I'm also like, the bike is hot. This is 12 o'clock. I'm so hot. I'm like, I'm sort of like tired of talking to him, uh, mm -hmm. trying to convince him that I don't have cash. They say, listen, you're not supposed to even be doing this. <laughs> and he did not like that at all. So he stands up. Sorry, stands up. He sort of moves away and moves away into, and by the way, mind you, there's, there's a mountain here and there's a drop off. There's nowhere yeah. to go. You can't yeah. go around. I can't turn. It's also a hill. So I'm like, I'm stuck there mm -hmm. in front of him. Goes to the corner, picks, drops his shovel and picks something up from the bush and comes with machete. <laughs> And he's like carrying the machete and walking to me. And he's like, well, if you don't pay. And I'm like, what? And I'm thinking so fast. And Joel doesn't know what's going on. We're connected to the thing, but he doesn't yet get what's going on. And I fucking remember that I had the, the, the rabbit pocket on the ether jacket behind here it had this rabbit pocket where I, I knew I had three dollars, like crumbled up <laughs> in there. And I'm like, oh, I like, it comes to me, it's like, I have, I have dollars. And suddenly he's like, oh, that's cool. So I take the three dollars, give it to him, which is basically less than what he asked us for. Yeah. And he's like, great, have a nice day. And I'm like, holy shit. So I think that was the worst, most dangerous moment that I think we experienced beyond the crash, which probably we'll talk about it later. But that, that is, the crash was created by me. This was created by someone else. At the same time, Guatemala is a very safe place. Guatemala is a beautiful place. I think this is an individual, it's not a country. And I think yeah. we, we, we blame countries for individuals. And I think that's ex massively unfair. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's assholes everywhere. <laughs> yeah. and there's incredible people everywhere. Yeah. French, Spanish, American, there's assholes everywhere. So <laughs> let's not put uh, countries um, down because of a few assholes, you know? Yeah, no, no, I, I agree, I totally agree. You guys documented the trip as well, and we can see that on, on the Instagram and also the book, but we'll be talking in a minute. Um, what kind of camera gear did you guys travel with? So this is, for you actually, this is a very good question right now because I speak about it in the book. I wanted to film, mm -hmm. so I'm going to make it short because otherwise we can talk about the camera for 50 hours, mm -hmm. but I wanted to film small, which I did, by the way, small interviews of creatives, craftsmen, creatives of all kinds mm -hmm. along my trip, the trip. Okay. So we um, bought the A7S II, which at the time was new. It was a great camera, had all the features, and also had some of the slow motion features, uh, slow mo fix fe features that the R2 didn't have, the sort of the 120 frame and stuff like that. Better ISO, ISO and the lower range, you know, da da da, all that stuff. Uh, the five axis stabilization, in body and the lens, like for filming, made a lot of sense. The mm -hmm. only thing that I thought about later when I was making the book, but also. When I bought it, it's like, oh, 12 megapixels for pictures? That's great. What the fuck do I need anything bigger? Mm -hmm. These are just memories. And this is important that for later, like, I didn't think I was going to make a book. I didn't think I was going to make anything. Oh. I just went okay. to take pictures for myself. These were for me. Yeah. That's oh, why wow. I took 12 megapixels. Yeah. So I was like, these are big. You know, <laughs> for screens, they're huge. You don't need anything else. So. Yeah. I wanted a film camera that took good stills. And one of the parts I think is important for this show specifically is that I didn't buy the best lens for two reasons. Mm -hmm. Money, three reasons. Money, weight, mm -hmm. and money and weight and space. Because I put my camera always, this is why I took so many pictures, it was always in my tank bag. It's not okay. like, oh, let me go open, the, turn it off the bike. No, it's right there. So I open it with the bike on, take it out with my gloves. Like mm -hmm. pull my thing up. This is why I also take a, a yeah, and boom, boom, boom. Sometimes I get off, sometimes I don't. But I could take a picture. A lot of the pictures are taken from my bike, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> Zoom, 70, uh, 24, 70. Real 24, 70, full frame. The lens, though, 
I don't love, but it was very versatile. That's the thing. Fucking light, super, it's a very narrow light when it's compressed, it's very light. Uh, and if anything happened to the lens, which it did when I had the crash, it's not $3,000. Yeah. Today, I'm thinking about it. I, I'm still thinking about it. What would I do for the next journey? I might do a better lens. Mm -hmm. But fuck, they're heavy, man. The good lenses are heavy. One fours, yeah. one eights are very heavy. Uh, yeah. You know why, but. Yeah. And I might. So I found myself, actually, I did this five documentaries, small pieces. Um, and then, well, I haven't edited them yet. That's another conversation. But uh, I found myself taking pictures, which is something <laughs> I did in high school and I did all over like design school. So now if I was going to go, I probably would buy a 7R2, not the A9 and the stuff like that. Those are just crazy. They're more expensive. And I don't use, I'm not shooting sports. Yeah. yeah. So we can go into the details, but I think that 7A, uh, the 7R3. Yeah. For, with 42 megapixels and a good lens would be the way to go. Still, I'm not convinced in taking uh, my friend, Martin Duller from, uh, he had a book, he's a cyclist. He takes uh, uh, single lenses, what do you call it? Um, prime lenses. Prime lenses. Mm -hmm. To me, it is too much thinking. Yeah. It's just too much. Oh, I want to take this picture. Let me choose the lens. Yeah. I, no. I'm more intuitive. I'm more intuitive. Yeah. I mean, he's intuitive, but he knows like what he wants. I need yeah. to see it, you know? Yeah. Does that answer the question? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. So you mentioned already in the, in the answer, the book. So who doesn't know? Um, Matthias uh, did a book about the trip. It's awesome, by the way. Uh, we talk a little bit more in detail where you can get it later. But um, you said you didn't plan to make the book when you started the trip. There was something that came up later. Yeah, so my That's friend, more. I, was, I was just posting for myself and I was, I was doing two things. I was capturing for when we were old farts and we could just laugh it out and show it to you know, my grandchildren and also <laughs> I wanted to capture, you know, I love photography. I just wanted to capture these moments. I knew that it was worth, something would be worth capturing. And, I've, and a friend of mine, Noah from Barcelona, asked me maybe three months in when she saw enough pictures, it's like, are you, you're going to make a book, no? Like, it was not even a question. You're going to make a book, no? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not making a book. Yeah. I was like... Because to me, the reality, and this is the, the beautiful part, and this is sort of like, it took me a while to convince myself because the reality of the things that I was seeing was more powerful than the pictures themselves. Mm -hmm. Then when I come back in months past, and that reality is diluted and sort of dissolved into the memory a little bit, the pictures brought me back to my oh. journey. Yeah. And when I saw that, I saw what I know I meant. Yeah. Yeah. What I know about seeing the pictures that I couldn't see when I was on the journey because the reality was way better. Yeah. So yeah. then in, uh, in Union Garage, we did a talk and then did a couple more talks and people mm -hmm. were asking me the same questions in a, good, in a good way. They were curious about the same things. And I thought, what would be more beautiful than to one, write this thing for myself as a full circle, close the circle. Uh, that's a fucking crazy bridge. Uh, <laughs> it's a crazy bridge. That's one of the craziest bridges I've fucking ever gone through. Let's, yeah. let's absorb the bridge for a second. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. You know, if you fall, if you happen to fall on the bridge, you're going down because yeah. it's, not yeah. wide, it's not wide enough to hold you in the bridge. The bike might not fall, but you're going over. <laughs> it's, it's not, when you look at it, it's like, no, it's, it's wide for, yeah, it's wide for riding, but it's not yeah. wide for falling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I still remember that bridge. Um, so everyone was sort of asking the same questions. I thought, how beautiful it would be to, one, have this memory, but also these people that were asking me these questions wanted to, one, travel with me, and also one asking me the questions is, how can I make this happen? Yeah. So I put myself, I put, you know, my, my purpose for the book was to share my story, but not just sort of, to share sort of the personal story of like, why do we travel? That why do we go and seek adventure? But also you can do this, mm -hmm. you know? And let me tell you how you can do this, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, 
and sort of breaking it down in, into elements that are sort of more atemporal, like not telling you, oh, buy this helmet. This helmet is not going to exist in 10 years. Books last for mm -hmm. decades. So I said, this is what I like about a helmet that mm -hmm. has this thing. So in 20 years, when someone writes in this beautiful thing about making a book about vintage BMWs as well, and this is not a book about, it's a book about a journey, a journey, mm -hmm. is that this book is never going to get obsolete. Yeah, because yeah. the bikes are already four years old. Yeah, so yeah. they already they still exist. So that's yeah. the thing. I'm not making a book about our R1100 our, our GS. Yeah, and this is all like so good quality. It's not a marketing show here, by the way. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. I love you. I'm a designer. <laughs> it's, As a it's designer, awesome. I went seeking for Gestalten because Gestalten has always produced high quality uh, books, mm -hmm. and I knew they would put it out in a way that was. Uh, they deserved and they're good printers and they're they respect they respect books they love books you know so mm -hmm. gestalt to me was sort of my obsession I, I wanted to do it with them and um and robert um the, the founder of gestalt is also a motorcycle writer oh, and guess okay. what he writes <laughs> that's the connection again BMW. BMW. Yeah. <laughs> so i mean but you know like it, it didn't have to be a bmw but like he loves motorcycles and he's been putting out books you know, the ride, he's been putting out uh, what's the, the, the currents with electric motorcycles. Like I was seeing this trend, that's why it made sense. I mean, I could have thought about Faden or other like uh, uh, publishers, but I thought the only ones publishing motorcycle books are Gestalt. So it made okay. sense. Yeah. Do you know- And they're German. Many, how, yeah, they're German, right? <laughs> Do you know um, how many books you guys sold already? It's... No. Uh, I'm guessing, I can't guess. You I can't really don't know. Maybe That's seven, fine. seven or eight. Seven or eight books? Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> you mean here in my- No, it's in, the, it's in the many thousands, but yeah, I really have no idea. Because we don't have like a, you know. And it, to be honest, yeah. I get this mm -hmm. question asked by my father. Like he wants to know how many books <laughs> yeah. I sold. And I said, dad, I don't care. And I- yeah. And I honestly don't care because to me, my journey, I mean, I, I, it's always nice to sell books. Mm -hmm. I like mm -hmm. the book to do well. And I do interviews and I do these things also for the book. I want it to be successful, but I want it to be out there. And if three people, if one person takes a journey because of the book, mm -hmm. I did, the, the, that's it. That's all I want. And I think I've already, you don't know how many DMs I get on Instagram. You inspire me. I'm actually doing this that like, yeah, we're just, we're just putting it out there for people to take it. You know, it's like, yeah. it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's more rewarding than thinking how many copies. This yeah. Book out. yeah, that's true. So if you, for people who are planning to do something similar, going for a long trip or long journey. So you guys were about like six months traveling. What is the budget? What do you have to calculate roughly? Everyone wants to know. Everyone wants <laughs> yeah, to <for> know. Sure. <laughs> um, okay, so the thing is that the budget, it's like everything else. Mm -hmm. How do you budget your vacations? How do you budget your restaurant go out? How do you budget your camera equipment? You know how you budget. If you have $10,000, you buy $10,000 worth of fucking camera equipment. If you have 3,000, <laughs> you buy $3,000, meaning, it's in the book. It's an equation. It's not like I'm going to tell you a number. Mm -hmm. We were two and we did some things. We had some problems. We had to do things also where we had to spend more money and sometimes less money. If you have more friends in South America, you'll spend less. So I can't give you a number yeah. that will be like, yeah, that's a good number. But you can do this equation. I'm telling you the equation in five minutes and you'll get an approximate. <laughs> Gas. How many? Yeah. Oh, and I know from Brooklyn to Patagonia, there's 20,000 miles. Yeah. How many miles per gallon? How many tanks? That's the amount of gas. Mm -hmm. You need to eat twice a day, maybe three times. Twice a day is enough, maybe once. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna cook for yourself every time and camp? That's one budget, and I know people who've done that. Yeah. Do you wanna go to a restaurant and sleep in a hotel every night? That's another budget. Either or, calculate, an average in Bolivia, it's seven dollars a meal. In New York, in New York, in Virginia, might be forty. Mm -hmm. But 
do every day, you know, how many days do you put 168 days, you know, times twice, two times, 168 twice times the average. Yeah. 12. Yeah. 12 dollars. Yeah. That gives you the amount of uh, food, gas, and now lodging. Same yeah. thing. And you're going to guess because then you're going to have things that you didn't expect. Mm -hmm. and someone will say stay in my house for free don't pay anything for four days mm -hmm. like or 10 days or 15 days over a long period of time so i think you need and also you could say i have this amount of money mm -hmm. then do the same equation but backwards yeah. okay I have this money. so how much can i break it down into three and say how much money i can spend on those things? these are yeah. the three things you really need that's yeah. it food yeah. lodging and gas all right Okay, cool. I will do some math and yes. <laughs> the number will be too big. And we can do this <laughs> offline. I can, I can help you with the equation. But. All right. But yes, um, so you said the trip, this trip was about three years ago. So yes. what's coming up next? Are there any bigger plans? Well, my dream has always been doing Africa, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I started thinking about Africa sort of right after I um, came back because it felt sort of like the ultimate place to visit and and also like in a good way south america was also like a training ground it's easier to be in south america i would never recommend anyone to go straight i mean i don't know to go or go to africa first you know mm -hmm. um but if they want to they should do that no um i feel more confident that i can deal with africa now because i trained into sort of the lower ground uh i think africa is I, I know people who are and have been there. Uh, again, Kinga, Leah, Sinjit, uh, um, Natalie, uh, Nat, Nat um, Tim, uh, Tim Burke, and a bunch of people. Uh, uh, Minches from uh, Minches Olivier from uh, Piki Piki Africa travel. Like there's so many, both <laughs> solo riders and couples traveling through Africa, and they say it's the most incredible fucking place that they've yeah. seen. And uh, I think we have conceptions about being dangerous, but mm -hmm. I mean, there's danger any, anywhere, you know, and everywhere. So I'm excited for, for Africa. Is it, we're in COVID now, look at you and me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's up in the air. Um, I'm building a motorcycle though um, mm -hmm. for it. It's basically everything I learned that I wanted to improve uh, on that R80 GS um, built in into this one, better front suspension, taller bars, lower mm -hmm. foot, feet, foot, like uh, foot pegs. So, because mm -hmm. even I'm 5'8", I'm, I'm not even tall, mm -hmm. but I was always sort of slouching forward a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's just a shitty, it's just a shitty position to be. Yeah. So lowering my foot and hiring my bars a little bit, it's not crazy. Um, so better position and, you know, uh, better front forks and rear suspension, um, maybe a, a, also a fatter tire. Um, and more gas, um, mm -hmm. more gas, more, more gas, yeah. <laughs> gas is freedom, man. gas is, gas is freedom, literally, you know, I have, uh, yeah. Matthias, I have one picture that we need to talk about, let's talk um, about it, you, you know which one it is, <laughs> what happened Woo! here, and how are you capable, to this picture stresses me out, man, <laughs> this picture stresses the shit out of me, oh, okay, so, I'm going to make it short because this story is fucking long. It's like, actually, it's like a eight page story in the book because there's a lot more to it. What, 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 what do you think you want to know? Do I, should I just tell the whole thing? Uh, no, go ahead. What, whatever you want. Uh, I mean, this, this happened in, uh, in Bolivia. We were going to Uyuni, coming from Oruro. And uh, what happened is that we were with this third guy, Simone, Italian guy from Rome, super cool, uh, riding on a DR650. DR650 are lighter and very capable off-road. Um, he's also a great off-road rider. Um, mm -hmm. Our bikes are very, very good on-road. The GS, it's a fucking awesome bike for the road. Also mm -hmm. off-road, but it's heavier and it's different. That day, I was carrying also three extra jar, uh, uh, not jars, uh, a bit, uh, I think it's a gallon. So three, three more gallons, which is 15 kilos which mm -hmm. my bike is already lift uh, heavy and I put 15 kilos extra in the very tip because we needed the gas. I was the one to carry it. 
I didn't think about it, the very tip <laughs> of the back of my bike. And that changes also a little bit of the weight distribution and the geometry mm -hmm. a little bit. I should have probably stiffened and like stiffened my rear suspension. I didn't think about mm -hmm. it. We're going through this thing and we're going full throttle, not full throttle the car side, like 120 miles per hour, but full throttle because we are already at 3,500 3, meters, which is 13,000 feet. So we're full throttle, we're going maybe 55, 60 miles per hour. The bike can go 90, if you open throttle, can go 90, 95. Full throttle was 55, 60. And at some point, the first, the last thing I remember is like, shit, I'm not holding the handlebars. That's the thing. <laughs> like, I'm just not holding them. And I thought, that's not good. That's why I thought, that's not good. <laughs> and then black, you know, and this is a picture taken with my camera, uh, with my, with my uh, little session GoPro. And that oh. is the moment, is the last frame before I hit the ground with my head. As you can tell, I don't know if you can tell, the, the bike at that moment, it's still aligned with the road. The bike is aligned with the road right now, still in the air and upwards, but it's aligned with the road. I'm actually perpendicular to the road. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the the yeah. bike is going like this. I'm like this. My head, I'm, I'm also like this. My head, is, my head is like, you know, right here, you know? Yeah. So I'm about to hit. This is why you need very, very good helmets and very good gear. Yeah. And, you know, that saved my life. I was, I had yeah. work. It was fucking hot and I was wearing gloves, so did Joel, and gloves, jacket, pants, helmet, boots, and the ether suit had shoulder pads, had elbow, had chest pads, had knees, hips, mm. back, all of it. Never yeah. would ever ride a thing like this without any of those, or without any of those. I, I need to ride with all of those. Um, yeah. That saved all of my parts. And I, my memory now is based on the video. We don't record everything. We just happen to yeah. be recording that day. We recorded yeah. maybe 10 minutes a day, max. Yeah. Like yeah, here yeah. and there, one minute. This, I just, I think I forgot I was recording. Mm -hmm. So I didn't turn it off. Yeah. And then this happened. But um, you, were, you were fine or you have to go to office? I was yeah. fine. The first thing mm -hmm. I remember is like, I'm in the ground. I don't fucking, I don't know where I am. I literally mm -hmm. look around and say, I have no idea where I am which is weird. Yeah. I, knew I, was, I knew I was with Joel and I knew, I'm in shock, no? I knew I was with Joel and I knew I was in a trip with him. I knew I, what I, we were doing, but I didn't know because that's an older memory. But yeah. I didn't know we were in Bolivia and I did not know we were in Naruto. I was like, where are we? Yeah. I have no uh -huh. idea. Okay. So, you know, it shows you how fragile we are, you know? And, um, and the first thing I remember doing even in the shock is I move my, my toes, see if I broke anything, see if it hurts. Yeah. I move my, I'm like, I'm like laying down up and I'm moving my fingers. And then I start like moving slowly all of my things, but slowly, cause it mm. could be like broken yeah. fucking yeah. leg. And I'm like, nothing, Maybe, like yeah. nothing. Like that doesn't make any sense to me, you know? <laughs> so, and also I have a bad, I, I had a surgery, but I had a very bad shoulder that I used to look at it 30 times before the journey. I did the surgery before the journey. And I was like, not even the shoulder came out? I was like, fucking miracle. Um, and, you know, that's one of those things that, you know, I don't know if you believe it or believe in all those things or not, but my sister, I think my sister said, okay, you idiot, you know, and picked me up and said, fine, just yeah. slow down, just slow down. Yeah. Do no, I'll do it once, you know, just slow down. And I think she picked me up uh, as I was falling and said, okay, I'm going to make it a little easier on you. Still, I was in pain for three days. Um, oh, yeah, I bet. Yeah, yeah, because you, listen, if you jump anything at 60 miles per hour, you're going to be in pain. It's oh, yeah. hurtful. Um, my, my, my ribs were in pain. My hip was in pain for three weeks. My left hip, which is what I hit. And, and then I spent three days in my mind, fixing the bike alone most of the day. And Joel knew, you know, I needed to be with the bike by myself, sort of rebuilding myself mm -hmm. and my confidence and thinking shit. And he told me later, like he was thinking, are we, are we gonna keep going? This is yeah. very traumatic. It's like a big yeah. fucking, and the bike was fine. By the way, that's a good thing about it. Yeah. These bikes are fucking strong. Like look yeah. at the thing. 
look at the thing. And it, it yeah. wrote another 8,000 miles. <laughs> but I was, I was, I, it took me three days, like to just nine, 10 hours a day thinking. And, you know, it's very meditative. You're working on the thing, you're fixing, but also you don't need to think so much. Mm. And you're mm -hmm. like thinking about all this. And I'm trying to say, and I, I came to the conclusion that, that I would regret it for the rest of my life. Yeah. That yeah. I would regret leaving that day. That yeah. my fears, that I wasn't run over. I run myself over, you know? Mm -hmm. That I could change things, that I could just go slower, that I could just take it easier, you know? Yeah. And to be honest, the reason why I crashed is because I was following Simone, and Simone is a very capable off-road rider, and I was going faster than I should have gone. And yeah. I knew that. Yeah, I knew that. Happened, happened in a second, right? Yeah. Yeah. Matthias, I would like to use the chance to wrap this up, but can you please tell the audience uh, where they can get the book and where they can find more information about you and, and the trip? Um, the book is available both in, in, it's actually available all over the world, thanks to Gesaldem, they're amazing. Um, Amazon in the US, free shipping, which is great. And in Gestalten also has free shipping in the US and has, I think, some free shipping in Europe. But it literally, you can buy anywhere in the world. And um, about me, I don't know, I actually don't have a website right now. I'm, trying, I'm thinking about me, re making my website. I'm a, yes. I'm a UX designer without a website. You know, <laughs> Uh, but that's my life. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, twowheelstyle.com and also Instagram. Instagram really has sort of a, a recollection. Right now, over the last three years, is a mishmash. Mm -hmm. But if you scroll all the way down, you can you can travel with us because that's how we were traveling. So. Matthias, thank you so much for sharing so much insight and Absolutely. answering the question honestly. Thank you very much and I wish you all the best for the next trip and we hope, all hoping that another book will come out in any <laughs> Well, I look forward to when, when uh, social distancing is gone and we can just go for a ride. We both live right. in yeah, For those who don't office. know, we both yeah. live in so. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a beautiful, a beautiful time. Thank you. Thank you, man. Take care, man. Thank you very much. Bye.